So, hello, everybody. Uh, yes, today I'm gonna share a bit of uh, my experience of, on the project I was working on. So, my name is Anton, I'm Ruby developer. Uh, and first of all, I'm gonna start with the apology. Apology that uh, that presentation is not at the top best because I only spent like six days working on it because I only be given I was given six days notice that I'll be talking tonight. So uh, yeah, so keep that in mind because yeah, like it, I'm, it's bad. It's bad. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um, so yeah, so it's a story about the startup. So that's a project, like startup project that uh, I was involved two years ago. Um, so, and the story starts with a bit of background. And as I've discovered, um, so we have a massive monopoly on public transport. So there is a bit, like pretty much only one company per city can operate public transport, which kind of, I found it very interesting. So, and the kind of, if you look, why we don't have like a separate, you know, bus company, because you know, you can't. So, but then, you know, obviously all the new innovations, the companies like Uber comes along and they, you know, they disrupt the market. And with the um, Uber pool recently, you know, it's kind of like, it's a new market, new industry that didn't exist before. So, and what government tries to do and government tries come and regulate and, you know, do some changes. Uh, and uh, so one of the example is uh, now, let's say in Sydney, you are actually allowed to operate small uh, buses up to like 13 people. So that's, you know, they're already like trying to come up with the kind of ways. And that's probably, I think like Uber pool kind of falls into that category because it's uh, like a public transport because you, you need to categorize it in order um, like to tax it and to apply rules to it. So, and you know, that creates a new business opportunities when you, you know, when government ch changes something and what wasn't possible before, now, you know, there could be new business. Uh, but, you know, we can get a glimpse into the future uh, and see what it is in California. <laughs> so in 2014 in San Francisco, there is a new company uh, was founded. Uh, and that company will, is called Chariot. And I'm sure there are plenty of others uh, and two years later, that company was sold for 65 million in 2016. Um, so whatever they did, you know, looks like a pretty good deal. So, you know, you might be interested now, like, uh, so yeah, so what is it? So Chata, uh, Chariot is a computer uh, shuttle service and uh, pretty much it's like a um, Uber and a bus together. So pretty much, uh, as you know, everybody go to work every day, and you want very convenient service to get to work, and you want it cheap. So that's what Chariot does. Does it provides the buses for just for commute to work in the uh, in the morning and in the evening. That's it. So and that's what I was hired to build. Um, yeah, and I was joined the project in November 2016. So the goal was to build something like that in, in Australia. So um, let's define the problem. So the service, uh, the bus service actually is targeted for rich people because you know, like it's a very, it's an exclusive service, right? You would pay extra to have extra, like pay extra money to get more comfort when you commute into work. Uh, and so you need rich people. So uh, as I've discovered, the uh, rich people live in Bondi, one of the uh, most expensive suburbs in, uh, in Australia. Uh, so yeah, people live in Bondi and they go to work in the city. The problem is the, uh, the closest train station is actually outside of Bondi. So those people who live in Bondi need somehow to get to the train station. So obviously there are buses, but you know, it's a very, like, I think it's also one of the uh, mostly densely, densely populated area in Australia as well. So yeah, it's a, it could be Sorry. quite busy at times. <laughs> so, um, so we need to build like uh, Uber, Uber like app. So we need to pretty much book a seat on the bus 
uh, see bus in, uh, in real time on the map. Uh, once boarded, we want to see what time we're going to arrive at the you know, destination. And pretty much only difference to the, you know, if it simple example Uber app, only difference is um, the shuttle operates on the fixed route, like a, like a bus, and you need to choose the bus stop where you're going to be picked up. That's pretty much your only difference. So um, let's draw some, you know, game plan. Like, you know, that's pretty much like where we started. Like, okay, so what do we need to kind of build this uh, service? So we need a passenger app, so so people to book the tickets. Uh, we need the driver app, so driver like sends the, you know, anyway, driver will we'll get to it. And we need some sort of kind of server. So pretty much we have like three big uh, part of the system. So, oh, excuse me. So for the passenger app, uh, just remind you again that that was a startup. Like the goal was to get quickly to the market, try the idea, and you know see where it goes. Uh, so a lot of decision kind of falls from that. So for the uh, passenger app, we use the Ionic framework. Uh, that's an Angular um, backed by Angular. So reasons, you know, I had experience with it before. It's you can build hybrid app for iOS, Android at the same time. It's great for building apps fast. And yeah, it's very good ecosystems. So the, that was the tag for that. Uh, so the driver app. So driver need to send the allocation pretty much, you know, in real time. Uh, so the driver need to show the map where they're driving to where to take the turns, uh, the where what time they should be at the specific stop times. You know, like a bus driver, you need to know like okay, I'm picking up people at like 5:43 or something like that. Uh, they need to see the passengers, mark the passengers when they're leaving out. Uh, and here we have a few options. It's either build a separate app, integrate into the passenger app, or you might have not, no app for them. Um, do you, do you want to guess which one we did? No yeah, so we did no app. <laughs> so we just relied on browser and with a bit of UGS, but yeah, so pretty much it just Java was uh, driving around with the Safari open. Um, yeah, and it's, it's actually worked quite well. <laughs> so, um, so the server. So that's pretty much why you're all here. Or that's why, why I'm, I'm here. <laughs> but yeah, um, so we're going to be dealing with pretty much real-time data. So that's pretty much we only care about the data, what's happening right now. Like we don't really care where bus drive was like one minute ago. If, so yeah, the information like expires very quickly. So again, that's November 2016, and you know Elixir was very hot at the time, and uh, and actually Elixir, is, I would say, uh, it fits like perfectly for that. It's you know it's designed to handle the real time data. Uh, although I'm a Ruby developer, so that was kind of decision you know use correct technology or deliver something quickly. Uh, and yeah, like we, we chose Rails. So. <laughs> um, and you, you know, you might be thinking, you know, I'm a problem. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's um, have a like rough overview of the system and how pretty much everything interacts. Uh, so we have Ruby on Rails kind of in the middle. You know, that's a server. Uh, we have the passenger app built in Ionic, which just talks to API through Ajax, you know, to Rails app. Nothing, you know, innovative there. Uh, driver app is just like normal web page with a bit of Ajax and Vue.js. Again, very simple. Uh, and all of the real-time data and web sockets just done for the external service. Uh, it's called Ebly, and there are a bunch of others like Pusher and yeah. So pretty much, you just make a post request, and they just you know distribute the web sockets to pretty much uh, you know different devices. Uh, and just to mention, there has also been an admin panel, pretty much for pretty much me to manage all of the buses, shuttles, and uh, times. Um, yeah. So they, you might have question why we use this external web socket server and why we haven't used Action Cable. Um, and yeah, it's November 2016. Action Cable is four months old. It's only, you know, brand new. And, you know, back then uh, there were some scaling issues and which, you know, been resolved later on. Uh, and 
Would I use it today? Yeah, probably, because it actually would make a lot of impl implementation simpler. Um, yeah, because the problem with WebSockets is they drop out quite fre frequently, especially if you, you know, somewhere outside or on the bus or on the train. Uh, as, as we discovered, like from city to this uh, train station, when you're coming from work, you like pretty much there's like 10 minutes or like five minutes when you just like drop out connection. And yeah, so it's, it's, it's kind of a big problem. Uh, so let's have a look example for the real-time updates, how that would kind of flow. So the, the driver, you know, sends locations or sends some requests to, to the server. Server talks to the Ably provider and provider just, you know, pushes all that real-time data to the, you know, mobile apps. So, you know, very simple. And if we, because we've also been dealing with the, like getting the uh, traffic data from uh, Google Maps, that's also been, like, will be updated for the uh, web sockets. So, uh, Rails with async architecture. I was I was thinking how to call it architecture because you know it's uh, I was trying to come up with the name. So best name I, would, I gave it is async architecture, but you know don't quote me on that. It's totally non scientific and you, yeah, yeah. So. Now we're kind of going even deeper, like how it actually operates on the server. So we'll start with the cron. So let's say every couple of minutes, we want to check the um, Google Maps data to see like what's the traffic's like. Um, so that's we're gonna create an event inside our uh, Rails app. And you know, we're gonna ask Google what's the traffic, get some traffic data back, and we're gonna save it to Redis. So that's you know, and that's what we're gonna do like every couple of minutes. Um, let's say then another example, let's say driver. Driver says, hey, like my location is blah. Uh, that's gonna be posted to controller. Controller gonna say like, yep, let's create an event. Uh, and we're just gonna store that location in Redis as well. Um, yeah, we're using Redis because it's, oh no. Yeah, because like it's a real-time data, it only leaves like few seconds. There is no point even the touching database. Uh, but also that event is will be broadcasted to all of the mobile devices. So that's you know happen like in parallel simultaneously. And also when the bus driver sends us location, we're also gonna check if the bus is near the stop. Because you know, if the bus is near the stop, we wanna mark that you know the stop is already like done. So you can't pick up passages anymore. So we're gonna, you know, run a bunch of logic. Uh, we're gonna pretty much take this traffic data, calculate the new schedule, and again, then broadcast new schedule to again all of the uh, like mobile apps. So you might be thinking, what what is this event? So it's actually it's just a background job. So every, we've just been using background job as this. Um, a synchronous uh, mechanism of running a lot of things in parallel and yeah, just like have a sync system and everything done through uh, background job queue. So yeah, it's just backed by Sidekick. Uh, for the cron, we use the uh, Sidekick cron jam. Uh, and for the Redis, because we relied a lot of on Redis, so there's a Redis objects jam that just like wraps it up into the object. So actually when you work, um, you can get the almost the same interface as the uh, active record, and then you just say, yeah, I got like a bus object, and then you can get it in and out from Redis, uh, and that's, it's very easy to work with. And one thing, actually, if you go to the, if you know, if you open the Rails app, uh, because you know, I just mentioned like everything is a background job, and if you go to the Rails app, you'll see zero workers and zero jobs there. So, which is, you know, could be confusing. Uh, but actually, everything was done through service object pattern. So, each event is a service object. And each service object can be synchronous or asynchronous. So, and you can just pretty much, it's kind of the same mechanism, the same class, everything the same. It's just like a single parameter. You just, you just say, do I want to run it now or do I want to run it later? And that made it super easy to develop because you know sometimes you want to run right now, sometimes you want to later, and all you need to do is just like change like one keyword, and you know just works. Um, 
Yeah, for the service objects, uh, the backbone pretty much the JM used for active interaction, and uh, for asynchronous extension, the another JM active interaction extras, which has actually been developed and extracted into the JM uh, from this project. Uh, and yeah, it's like service objects is like Swiss Army knife. Like it's they use for form objects, they use for service object, they use for workers. It's you know the same class, same interface for everything, which is you know very convenient. So let's talk about the challenges with the project. It's more like a business, and because you know, like I'm new to this industry uh, and never dealt with real-time data. It's like let's see what sort of issues. Um, so yeah, first of all, GPS issues. So yeah, we use the um, browser. So as we discovered, browser only sends GPS location if the tab is active. So if you switch the tabs, close the saf Safari, mm, there is no bus location anymore. <laughs> so yeah, it, it, it's kind of limiting, especially when the, you're calling the driver, and driver, you know, like there's some deal, dealing with issues, but you know, when the driver answers the phone, there is no more location. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. so yeah, it's, uh, the signal is not very accurate uh, in the city, especially in the tall buildings or very narrow, narrow streets. So that's kind of a problem. Uh, so, and it's, as I've discovered, it's pretty much it's a balance between accuracy and real time. You can get like location, real time location within like, you know, one second, like where the bus or less. But the problem is because you're gonna get like constant stream of different locations, you know, if you actually put it on the map, it will be just like moving around. <laughs> so, and the thing is, um, so response rate for real time update with our app was actually better than Uber, but the problem, the accuracy wasn't that good because what Uber does, um, you know, they just like take the average within the 10 seconds or like 30 seconds and put it on the map. So that's why like, you know, when you're waiting for the Uber, it's like, oh, one minute away, and, but it's actually there. So that's that's kind of the problem to make it accurate versus the real time. So yeah, ours was more real time, but less accurate. So sometimes it's kind of like jumps and then, oh yeah, it goes back. Um, so yeah, that's something you have to deal with. Um, so another problem is actually because we're running on the fixed, kind of not fixed schedule, but on the schedule, uh, because you know, when you book in the pickup time, you say, oh, I wanna pick up, um, I want you to, I want the bus to, I want it to be picked up. Uh, it's, uh, you know, in 40 minutes from this specific spot. So pretty much you need to lock in the pickup time, but then it's, uh, it's very hard to stick to that, you know, the estimation. Because in 40 minutes time in, you know, in traffic, it's actually, it could be plus or minus 10 minutes. Uh, and our goal was to, keep it as accurate as, as possible. Pretty much when you book it, that's where, what would be the actual time. And the, yeah, the goal was pretty much to be within one minute for the 30 minute prediction, which is very optimistic, as I've discovered. <laughs> so, and yeah, Uber easy, Uber doesn't do that because they don't need to give you the estimate, it changes all the time, plus or minus five minutes. It's like, it's you not know, this, yeah. Uber is easy, so bus is hard. So uh, let's uh, have an, just to give you a bit of context, pretty much, um, yeah, pretty much in, so let's say, um, again, Bondi, bus uh, train station. So you have, let's say from, you want to get from point A to point B, uh, and there will be some sort of route within the streets, right? Uh, on these streets, you will be a bunch of uh, stops where bus will be stopping. So that will be one route. Then from location B to A, there will be different route, which is also different stops. Uh, and that's uh, pretty much will be like a loop, we call it a loop. Uh, the problem is like Bondi is very old suburb. There are a lot of narrow streets, one way streets, um, because you know, like you can operate the bus, but then there are dozens of restrictions, uh, what you can and can't do. For example, you can't stop at the bus stops, uh, so you're only allowed to stop at the driveways or pretty much where any other car can stop. Uh, and that's actually limits the business opportunities uh, a lot. Um, yeah, and the problem is also like, you know, if the bus is running late or fast, they can just stop at the bus stop and just wait there. If you're operating like, like the shuttle, like there's no place to stop. Like if you 
you know, running too fast, you just have to drive. Um, yeah, so let's say uh, so morning shift, for example, morning shift, that's, you know, you run only in the morning and the evening. Uh, so yeah, one way will be, let's say, 14 minutes from A to B, roughly nine stops. Return will be 10 minutes from B to A with eight stops. So the total loop will be, let's say, 24 minutes. Uh, and then you'll have three loops uh, within three hours, which uh, results in 119 stops overall. So, and then you're gonna have like a, you know, schedule. You start with a schedule, optimistic schedule, let's say that's roughly our travel times. Uh, we're gonna publish all, the, all of the, you know, uh, trip times as well for each stop individually as well. Uh, and, you know, everything's great. But then the challenge is if you get delayed on one of them, pretty much everything is delayed. And pretty much, yeah, like it's uh, pretty much adds up very quickly. Um, and the thing is, like, traffic jams is pretty much the major contributor to it. And another thing which you wouldn't think in, like, normally, for example, like just traffic lights, because there are traffic lights on the major intersections that can take up to like a minute to stand there, and if, it's, if there is a traffic, it could be like multiple traffic lights you need to wait, you know, and it's like a couple of minutes over the, you know, 14 minute strip, it's actually, it's a big deal. So for traffic data, we used uh, Google Maps. So pretty much we query travel time for each stop, between each stop, um, you know, for the whole shift, and we pretty much do it like every couple of minutes. And yeah, we just store it in Redis as a just cached version of the traffic. Um, yeah, and the problem that we found, <laughs> you discover the traffic jams sooner than the Google will tell you. Because, <laughs> you know, if you know how Google works, they pretty much just uh, crowdsource the data. And if you're standing in the traffic jams and there is a traffic jam and you are delayed, that's Google, oh, okay, Google need to mark that as a traffic jam. But we are actually there before, like, yeah. The, so pretty much, yeah, like, it's like five minutes or at least delayed. And Google tries to, uh, to do a good job of estimating and predicting, okay, Monday morning is gonna be, you know, that. Uh, but yeah, it's not really accurate as we discovered. And if it's raining. <laughs> so next question is, you might have is, does it scale? Yes. <laughs> So pretty much heavy lifting done by the WebSocket server. So we're not really doing this crazy amount of connection. And yeah, all you have to do is just few API requests per user. So pretty much, yeah, like the, we use the single small server, like, although we didn't have much traffic there. Um, so yeah, how, next question is, does it scale with buses? So, you know, we started, you know, it's a startup, start small. We started with the single bus. Uh, and you know, single bus just drive in circle, you know, that's all cool, fine. Uh, and then we've added the second one. And the goal for the, like once you have two buses, you have actually tons of problems. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the problem is because you want them to be spread, spread out as much as possible, so they're always on the kind of opposite side of the, of the loop. Uh, and the problem is actually very hard and kind of nat naturally uh, buses tend to drift together, uh, and it's just nature of traffic, nature of passengers, because if you, like, it's, it just always happens like that. And, uh, and the goal is, because, you know, you want to have kind of more, like, good service, because it's either you have two buses in two minutes, and then, like, 20 minutes of nothing. So, yeah, it just, like, provides, uh, shows up as a bad quality of the service. So, um, yeah, and they get together. So pretty much the, the challenge was like what to do with it. Uh, and the simple solution uh, is was pretty much just show the drivers the travel, like the time distance in the front for the bus and at the back. So pretty much you, drivers can, does it make sense? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, you just like, because you're kind of kind of driving in the loop, uh, so you just show like in this example, yeah, the time distance in the front is nine minutes and behind is 15 minutes and they roughly should be the same. So, and it just kind of tells the driver in very simple form like, okay, you need to slow down and you need to speed up if possible. Because usually speed up is not an option, it's usually the one should slow down. Um, yeah, and it just like show the just simple timer and the drivers can kind of manage it themselves. 
um, drivers can't see the other bus on the map, but the problem is when you deal with passengers in traffic, uh, on narrow streets in the bus, which doesn't really fit there, uh, they just don't have time to like see, understand, like, oh, where is that, yeah, how far is that other bus? So, um, we did, you know, all of changes, improvements, and yeah, that still wasn't good enough. So we had dynamic schedule, which adjusts to, you know, road conditions. We integrated Google Maps traffic. We had pretty much real-time bus location, which, you know, better than Uber in speed. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, drivers can balance all of the schedule, but the estimates we gave uh, for the travel times, like again, 30 minutes or one hour into the future, still wasn't good enough. So what was the solution? And the solution was to add a buffer time. So pretty much we just, we pretty much we've been running on this kind of ideal scenario, like pretty much what Google tells, pretty much all of the different variables. And then we just say, okay, we, it's still not good enough. We just give you extra 15 minute time, like into the schedule, 15% of time. So that's pretty much just gives extra, a little buffer for the drivers in case something's gonna go wrong. So it's pretty much we intentionally slowing down the schedule, but that's going to make it more consistent uh, and more predict, like accurate. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's pretty much it's a balance because if you think about it, if you delay it too much, the business losing money because you know bus is standing there rather than driving around. Uh, but yeah, it's just kind of again the balance. Uh, so a quick word about the team. So it's only been four of us. Um, single developer and me working full-time, designer part-time, business guy part-time, and operations guy part-time. And uh, me and designer, it's like the first time to the like company. So we've never worked with anybody before. So um, yeah, in a bit of time. So we've pretty much launched the private trial in two and a half months and launched the public in three and a half. And uh, after running for one and a half months, pretty much we closed it. Uh, but because it's yeah, for the business reasons, not for the tech reasons. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's almost, almost there, almost there. Anyway, so conclusion, conclusion. Um, so what looked like as a upcoming disaster with Rails, and out is pretty good. <laughs> so, so yeah, thank you. <laughs>
Well, that's why the Bondi was chosen, because that was pretty much the best bet in Australia to do it. Uh, the problem with Bondi, it's old suburb and it's very hilly, so there is actually not many options for the alternative route uh, for the bus. So even if you say oh, we're going to get from A to B, there's only like very like maybe three options you can try from A to B. Um, so yeah, that's kind of little like limited a lot. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, it's still a, it's still a trial trial thing. Yeah, but yeah, it was like they you know they really isolated one particular route. I was wondering if they were if if you uh, or if the business team went. Oh, I don't know. There's a there's a gap in the uh, the government's public transport route, and you know we're going to pick that, or if it was just cashed up people that they were you know they're going after. Yes, so th that's what we tried to do as well. We tried to identify, and we did. But the problem is, it's actually cost a fair bit of money to run the trial. Um, even like, and it's, you know, the problem is, you know, you're launching new bus service, like nobody knows about it. The bus stop actually can't be on the bus stop. The bus stop have to be like around the corner when nobody knows it's there. Uh, you can't put any signs. Uh, we've been kicked out from the train station because we've been given flyers. It's like, you know, it's very difficult. And, you know, and we, we did a lot of mail dropouts in the like local area. Uh, and yeah, it's very hard to, to, for people to change the like to change their behavior, because it's a new service, it's just like instead of going normally to bus stop, you have to go actually to other street because we you know we're running on the back streets. Um, yeah, so you know it's uh, it's not it's not like you can just you know change try different suburbs. You have to actually invest a lot of money and time before you can actually can see people responding uh, and actually yeah discovering your service. Um, so yeah, that's why like we've tried one. Like the, we had another one again in Bondi, but driving to the um, to the ferry. Uh, but we just decided pretty much it's not really worth it because the results uh, for this route wasn't really that impressive. So yeah. And actually, in terms of the pricing, uh, we tried it for four dollars a trip, uh, which cost you roughly four dollars actually to get from one night to the city. But the problem is, again, because it's a public transport, they subsidized, it's actually cost you 10 cents from your home to the train station. Because, you know, it's the same deal if you take a train and the bus. Uh, the bus costs, or like the second trip costs you pretty much almost nothing. Uh, and because we've been a separate company, you have to, you can't get that benefit. So pretty much you would have to pay $4 to get to the train station and then $4 uh, to get to the city. So it pretty much doubles your commuting costs. Yeah. Does it make you uh, more or less uh, frustrated by Melbourne buses? When they run on no, no. Well, Melbourne, Melbourne buses is never on time. Like, you, you're not. <laughs> Does it change your perspective? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Well, I, I think like all the bus companies, they're starting to provide the real time GPS location. Uh, they, they definitely have themselves. I'm not sure if they, you know, available for public. Um, but yeah, Melbourne bus, like Brisbane bus, is actually quite good. Uh, the Melbourne bus, you just never know. If, if, was it five minutes before, or was it ten minutes later, or is it just never going to come? It's just like, <laughs> like uh, buses. Although I prefer buses over trams in Melbourne. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't, don't even get started. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Cool. I guess not. Thanks, Anton. Right. Thank you.